is a Labour councillor uh, in Hammersmith uh, and Fulham, and she is the Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Shadow Cabinet Minister for the Olympics, um, Tessa Jowell, and she also worked for the children's charity, uh, the Children's Society. Uh, so without any further ado, let me hand over to Lisa. Um, well, thanks everyone. And can you hear me at the back? Yeah, great. Okay, um, I came into Parliament last year at what I think was an absolutely critical time. We've, we had coalition politics for the first time, certainly in my lifetime, the end of the Blair era, and I think a really significant opportunity to rediscover the radical left tradition that's been missing from mainstream party politics for most of my lifetime. But after just one year as an MP, I am increasingly convinced that the level of change that is needed in politics is so fundamental as to require a huge, huge overhaul of the way in which things are done, the things that we talk about and the people that we use to do that. There are issues that absolutely clamour for my attention um, in my constituency, but inside the Westminster bubble, they are so rarely the issues that we discuss. In Wigan, people are losing their jobs and their homes. They are genuinely frightened about the breakup of state education. I've got disabled children who not only can't get wheelchairs now, but probably will never be able to get wheelchairs. I have elderly constituents who are being denied medical care and are really, really worried about their future. And yet in Westminster, the debate is almost entirely consumed by AV, by the big society, by Nick Clegg, by the splits in the Labour Party, the splits in the Tory Party, the splits Splits in the Liberal Party and so on. Labour shadow cabinet elections. In the past six months, I have had just one letter from my 75,000 constituents about the alternative vote and not one single letter about the big society. But in the meantime, I've had enough letters about the economy and the real dire human tragedies that are unfolding right across my constituencies right now to fill an entire room. And I think that there is a recognition in Westminster that things need to change. But while I've heard countless talk about reconnecting people with politics, I've heard very, very little about reconnecting politics with people. My view is that politicians should be talking about these issues that so badly matter to people, but in a language that really resonates. We've lost the art of communicating in a language that is meaningful to people. It started with new Labour speak. Um, we've had, over recent years, the frequent bandying about of this term progressive and this progressive consensus that covers up a whole host of genuine, real and important disagreements about where we go next. We seem to have a prevalence of think tank speak and jargon. In Wigan, where I'm an MP now, in Hammersmith, where I used to be a councillor, and up and down the country, we are alienating people by the way that we are talking to them. And one of the things that has been so striking about David Cameron is that he found a language before the election, a language that we couldn't find to connect with people, that resonated with people. For most of my lifetime, politics has been based on the belief, mainstream politics, that the only way to win elections is to seek out the centre ground. But it is surely an essential part of democracy that politicians should not just follow, but actually provide that leadership. As Robin Archer of the LSE has said many times, that we should be seeking to define and not just seeking the centre ground. That's what I think Compass is so well placed to do, to shape the debate, to shape the issues, to define the ground that we need to stake out. We have to tackle the huge social policy crises, the challenges that are all but ignored at the present time by the major political parties, the growing crisis of care for the elderly and the number of disabled people, who are th children who are thankfully surviving into adulthood. But at huge cost to their families in terms of time and resources, we have families up and down this country who are stretched to breaking point because they're not getting the help and the support that they need. We need to tackle the issue of multinational corporations who are putting profits before people here and across the world at huge cost to some of the most um, voiceless communities 
in the world. We have to deal with this question of an economy that works not just for the few, but for a re really small few, a small, small handful of people, and quite simply does not work for the rest of us. And we ought to be discussing the scandalous lack of investment in housing over quite literally decades. And it, at the same time, we can't ignore the issues that so many of us on the left try to ignore immigration and welfare reform because we don't want to provoke the inevitable right-wing backlash. But when we tackle those issues, we should be staking out a new vision to lead and not just blindly follow. The old consensus has so clearly failed. It's led us up so many blind avenues and we, it's up to us to find a different narrative. Since I've been in Parliament, I've become more convinced than ever that that's what we need, politicians with the courage of their convictions to lead, not to triangulate, but to persuade and convince. I was recently reading Thurston Clark's brilliant biography of Bobby Kennedy, where he talked about the first tour in Bobby Kennedy's primary, where he went out on the road and he lost his nerve. And his advisers were saying, you should do this, you should go that way, you should go this way. Eventually, he left his advisers behind, he left his pollsters behind, and he went back on the road and met people and found his voice. He was listening, but he was also leading. And I think this is what the public want to see. I think this is why the bold, independent voices that there are, such as Caroline or such as John, although I don't always agree with everything that he says, um, are really, really important to people and important to politics. Without this, I don't think we can make any progress. Political parties are not irrelevant. The vast majority of people who vote still vote for the three major political parties, but increasingly people not only just don't vote, they don't even bother to register to vote. We have to find a new narrative or our voice becomes irrelevant. And it was Caroline Lucas, actually, who recently said that millions of people are denied a voice by this centre-seeking approach. And she's right. I grew up under Thatcher and have lived with the legacy of privatisation of the utility companies, of the railways, and so on ever since. That's why I don't believe that the privatisation of our public services, the NHS, education, the postal service, is the right approach. But for most of my life, most of my adult life, like millions of other people up and down the country, I have been unable to find a mainstream articulation of that, except... I have to say, from the trade unions, who have been a really important counter to that message. And in the tuition fees debate, it was just absolutely shocking that the thing that was really missing from that entire debate was the idea of education as a public collective good instead of an individual market-driven <laughs> entity. And, and that is why... I say that by trying to triangulate instead of trying to stake out an alternative vision, we are alienating people. And more than anything else, we're alienating people, I think, by this negative cycle of party politics that we've become absolutely wedded to. I don't in any sense seek to absolve my own party from the blame for this any more than I would seek to absolve any of the others. We have a media, though, that is preoccupied by division and dissent, where genuine debate, real important debate, is blown up into disunity. I do think the public care about unity. It matters that, as politicians, we stand on platforms that have coherence and meaning to people that enables them to make choices. But we can't continue to pretend that the complex issues that we deal with are black and white and not in the shades of grey that we are. they are. If we're going to solve these problems and not do people a disservice, we have to find the right solutions by bringing in the widest possible dialogue, not silencing the voices that dissent. Political parties were always broad churches, and we must, must become this again. More than anything else, though, I think that the public hate this negative cycle of party politics because it makes us all look the same. We look like a group of people who are playing political games while up and down this country people are losing their jobs, their homes, their pensions, their public services. The Liberal Democrats may have taken most of the brunt for the broken promises narrative that's become so predominant in the media and in Westminster, and for some good reasons. But what all of the major political parties, my own included, need to realise is that that sort of mudslinging, that party political game playing harms us all. In the long run, it won't do any of us any favours.
And, and finally, I would simply say this, that change has to come to politics. The way we do politics, the things we talk about, the way we talk about them, and, and how we achieve it. If that change does not come, the consequences for the people in my constituency are absolutely unthinkable. But having been a Member of Parliament for just one year, I do not believe that that change is going to come from the inside, despite the fact that there are many of us who would deeply, deeply like to see it and will do all we can to prompt it. I think it has to come from here, from the people in this room and the people outside of this room who believe in social justice, believe in the same things that we do. It's only if we start to demand it, I think, that things will get better. Thank you. Our next speaker is Simon Hughes. Um, we're delighted that he's here and able to join us today. Um, Simon uh, is deputy leader of the Liberal Democrats. He's the MP uh, for Bermondsey and Southwark. Um, and actually, Simon, I just want to use this opportunity to kind of pay tribute to the work that you did uh, in fighting uh, for Mehdi Kazemi uh, to be granted asylum in the UK. He was a gay man. Um, and he would have been deported to his homeland um, of Iran if it wasn't for the work uh, of Simon, and he would have almost certainly been, been executed um, as his boyfriend was. Um, and so I'd like to pay tribute to the, to the work you did on that, Simon. Thank you. Gavin, thank you very much, both for the invitation and those kind words, and I'm very happy to be on a platform uh, with... Uh, both Lisa and John, both of whom are hugely respected in Parliament and I personally respect greatly. It's probably a, not a coincidence that on the day that um, you celebrate the opening of your doors as compass to people from other parties, I got stopped this morning at the event before last I went to by somebody saying, why aren't you in Wrexham today with the rest of them, Simon? <laughs> uh, and I had to very quietly point out that if he hadn't noticed, I wasn't actually just for the moment in the same place in the political spectrum. But there you go. Uh, we uh, clearly haven't got the message over to everybody. I just want to share with you a reflection. I've been in Parliament for 28 years, 27 years in opposition, uh, 14 years under the Tories, and 13 years uh, with the Labour government. I represent more people in council property than any other British MP, and probably do more immigration casework than any other MP. I just have to share with you quietly that the problems that were there when I started are not hugely different from the problems that are there now. The lack of housing that Lisa referred to, the shortage of good council property, the equal society, the equality of opportunity have not been delivered either by those 14 years of Thatcher major government or of the 13 years of Blair Brown government. So I hope that we all come to this debate conscious both of our own shared radical past but of our own shared radical failure. The radical past that we have is glorious. It's the past that goes back to the uh, governments of the early 20th century, setting up national insurance, setting up the state pension, uh, the people's budget. It's the shared period in the middle of the century, Beveridge writing and Attlee and his government delivering. My political hero is somebody called Dr. Salter, who was a liberal originally, found the liberals weren't good enough, so joined the Labour Party, found they weren't radical enough, and so joined the ILP, and was probably the best MP Bermsey ed ever had. Uh, and we've got to remember that radical past. It's been shared. The best of it's been shared. David Steele introduced the abortion law reform. Steve Ross, a Liberal MP, introduced a private bill giving rights to homeless people to be housed. Uh, so we mustn't rewrite history. And we have to therefore be honest that we are here today still battling with a huge gap between rich and poor, which widened under both of those types of government, with child poverty and pensioner poverty and fuel poverty at levels completely unacceptable for one of the richest societies in the world. And so I'm clear that when last year I tried to get a deal with the Labour Party, but the people like Mrs Beckett and Mr Blunkett and Mr Reid were clearly not keen, and many people in the Labour Party therefore couldn't deliver, and the figures didn't work, that nothing changed in my political lexicon for the things that I aspire to and my colleagues aspire to. I still have the same... Uh, preamble to my constitution in my pocket that I had 10 years ago and 15 years ago. It still says, uh, I seek to balance the fundamental values of liberty, equality and community. 
and in which no one should be enslaved by poverty, ignorance or conformity. And that's why I'm very clear that last year when it came down to the option Tory minority government or shared government, it was a better place for us to go and try to temper what would have been potentially six months or five years or 15 years of a Tory government in office and some of the best things. And I ask you to be objective, taking those on lowering.